All right, um, we'll get started. I want to welcome everybody to our uh, first part of our series of uh, Innovation Entrepreneurship Academy. Um, my name is Kevin Hopes. I'm part of the Innovation Entrepreneurship Initiative at Duke, and we have established an academy to kind of help bring these topics of innovation entrepreneurship to everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Duke Law Startup Ventures Clinic and Smith Anderson for being our first presenters and guests. Uh, we're first, Kevin. Very yep. first. Yep. <laughs> so uh, we're really looking forward to them going over this idea. If you have an idea and understanding, if you need a lawyer, I encourage you to uh, visit our website. We'll also send you a thank you for attending and a link to our future Innovation Entrepreneurship Academy offerings. Uh, you can find that on our IE website. We also have a, a sign-in sheet just to know who came and keep in touch with you. Uh, if your name's not listed from the RSVP, that's okay. Uh, just mark that on the back or if you're here. And um, to kind of facilitate some of the getting to know the audience of people who kind of share where they're from, whether they're at Duke, from the community, what they're doing here, uh, kind, of, kind of thing. I mean, and also if you like, if it's mm -hmm. Nick School for the Environment versus Computer Science, yep. that's helpful to us, just if you could rattle that off real quick. So anybody want to volunteer or starting? I'll start. Um, my name's Ross. I'm staff at the Career Center here at Duke, and I specifically work with undergraduates interested in media, arts, entertainment. Um, and I also work with students that are interested in the intersection of art and science, technology, so arts entrepreneurship as well. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Uh, my name's Kyle. I'm the School of Medicine. Uh, I'm Katrina, and I'm the Fire I'm Isaac, I'm at the IEC, I'm a PhD student. Mm -hmm. I'm Avanya, I'm a freshman in BME. I'm Jerry, I'm a sophomore in BME. I'm Lakshmi, I'm a senior, I'm majoring in ICS. I'm Sachet, I'm a sophomore, I'm majoring in computer science and economics. I'm Max, I'm a graduate student in environmental management. I'm Dean Yee, I'm a graduate student in science. I'm a joint degree at Dupa and at Nicholas. Oh, this is Sridharam. I'm a joint degree with the Computer Science and Nicholas School of Management. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a joint degree with the Jump right in. Uh, thank you all so much for, for coming. I, it's, I'm really happy we just did that. That was awesome to just kind of get a sense of, of kind of the diversity of, of the group here. Uh, it's great to go coming out and hopefully uh, we can teach a little bit about, uh, about what you need to think about as an entrepreneur and whether you need uh, legal representation or not. Um, so yeah, let's maybe come over here. Yeah, if our panelists do want to settle in. Yeah, you guys are welcome to take a seat. Um, so I think basically, uh, just as a kind of note up front, um, we're going to try and keep this a little bit, uh, you know, informal and very conversational. So uh, you know, we have some slides prepared um, and some things we want to make sure we get to. But if you guys have you know questions along the way, please don't hesitate to you know raise your hand and um, we'll call on you. And uh, it'll be very much kind of a, a give and take type thing. So um, to that end, uh, just before we get into, it, I just want to introduce. Um, Myself, uh, I'm Joe Onke. I'm a student uh, attorney at uh, the Duke Startup Ventures Clinic, and this is my co-presenter today, Megan. Um, and we're here with uh, Professor Jeff Ward at Duke Law School. Um, and we're also really delighted today to have uh, some special guests with us from um, Smith Anderson in Raleigh. Um, so this is uh, Peter Bosman on your right, and uh, Jeff Truitt on your left. And uh, hopefully, um, Matt and Laura will be joining us as well. Um, but these guys have just a ton of expertise, and uh, so you know they can answer, I'm sure, any or all of your questions. And um, afterwards, we're going to have a and A session. Um, so if you'd like to, you know, ask your questions then, or you know, talk to one of us or one of them in person, um, you're more than welcome to do that. And, and, and Joe, I might add that um, 
I, I assume that most of you have never heard of Smith Anderson, but it, it's actually a law firm in Raleigh, um, about 120 attorneys. Um, Peter and I both do a lot of startup work. Peter focuses more on the debt side. I focus more on, on the equity side. But um, we're, we're glad, glad we could join you. And that's true of Matt as well. When he, when he gets here, Matt works with lots and lots of startups. And we work closely with them. And we can talk about um, the services that various places offer. OK, so first question, why the lawyer hate? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, we've all kind of heard like the, the jokes and stuff about the lawyers. Um, and, you know, especially like as a, as a startup venture, you know, you might not want to jump right into getting a lawyer. Maybe it's not the first thing you think of when, when you think about spending your money. Um, but uh, just to kind of get into that a little bit, I, I decided to do a little bit of Googling. Uh, <laughs> I, literally, I did this two days ago, if you go on Google and, and type in lawyers are, this is what you will get, uh, which I think really kind of perfectly encapsulates uh, the, general, the general feeling about lawyers out there a little bit. Um, but in, in the specific context of, of entrepreneurship and innovation, um, you know, what are some of the knocks against lawyers? Uh, you know, lawyers tend to be, um, yeah, they, they tend to be perceived kind of as deal killers sometimes. Um, they're uh, perceived as like being a little bit cautious, a little bit over cautious sometimes. They move very slowly, you know, really crossing those T's and dotting those I's. Um, a lot of times they're knocked for not really understanding the business or not really understanding the needs of, of the clients that they're working with. Um, yeah, you can probably get them all. Yeah. Um, and maybe the last one, and possibly the most important one, is what I've alluded to already, is that you know, they are perceived as very expensive, right? Uh, lawyers, you know, their, their time is money, and, and it's often a lot of money. Um, but there's a couple things that I want to just highlight about that, especially on, on that last point. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, finding a lawyer and finding an affordable lawyer uh, towards the end of the, of the program. Um, but a lot of lawyers and, and law firms offer alternative fee arrangements. Uh, they offer um, different ways that, that entrepreneurs can engage in legal counsel. Um, you know, just aside from dishing out a, a very large lump sum of money up, up front. Um, and what is um, the expense at the front? If not, not taking that expense in the front end, what is, of course, the danger of not making that expenditure? What would you say? Losing your invention, losing your product, losing market, like making a contract and giving things away. So some of the expense now may end up um, saving you a lot later on. Yeah, Megan's, yeah, exactly right. The, one of the things we're going to talk about is, is how spending a little bit of money up front, like Megan said, um, can really, really save you uh, a lot of money and, and in fact can actually you know, preserve your business idea uh, down the road. I'll make one more comment about that. I always wondered, um, people will call us in the clinic sometime, and we of course offer pro bono legal services, but we do so for a very, very small set of those who need services. I mean, if this many people need services, we're able to serve only a small little group of that. So um, I'm often playing the role of helping people find appropriate counsel, right? Um, you have a great idea, you're a biomedical engineering student, and you're ready to move this forward and maybe form a company or license it, whatever it might be, you want to start protecting it, and you need somebody to go to. And, um, I actually find, and I'm, I'm going to not speak specifically about Smith Anderson, although that's one of the firms to which um, people are referred quite often because we work so closely with them, but uh, firms in general in the area oftentimes offer a startup package. If you have a developed idea, a business plan, and are ready to move forward, um, oftentimes there's a startup package, and I'm, just, I'm not promising this because you should talk to the firms, but you might be surprised to know that the number range is usually between a flat rate to get started with your formation, maybe even a stock option plan, et cetera, to get started, $2,000 to $2,500 flat. Now, that might sound like a lot of money. To me, it sounds very little compared to what most people think it's going to cost. And that is building a relationship with a firm that's going to be able to build with you and grow with you as you move forward. Um, you're going to get a lot in return, including, as Meg mentioned, a protected potentially the start of or at least counsel about protecting your IP. Um, you're going to get a company form to limit your liability. And you maybe even um, are building in some equity incentive plans that allow you to pay or 
incentivize people to work for your company in ways that save you on cash. That's a huge return on investment oftentimes uh, for a startup company. So I, I did want to throw out an actual concrete number so that people had a sense of what a basic package might cost them. So. Thanks, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, you know, kind of given, given all the, the lawyer hate, you know, maybe that's out there, um, you know, and all the reasons why it might be frustrating to think about paying um, for legal services when you're really just starting out um, with, a, with a new venture. Uh, we wanted to really present you with, with kind of four key takeaways of, of why it's really important to think about getting legal representation, even at the, at the very beginning of, of your idea. Um, so the first one, uh, leaving your current position, oh, we're going to talk about all of these uh, in, in, in a few minutes, but um, leaving your current position can be complicated. Uh, so for you guys in, in the room right now, obviously, you know, uh, most of you aren't, aren't working. Um, guys, uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is Matt Lenora. Yeah. Uh, he's an associate at Smith Anderson as well. So we're really happy to have him with us. Um, anyway, so for, you, for most of you guys in the audience, you know, you're not working right now. Um, you don't have a current position to leave. So that's not going to be necessarily immediately applicable. But we want you to kind of think about these things uh, over time and, and hopefully you know, you'll have jobs eventually. And, uh, and if you have uh, an idea while you're at a job, um, some of the things we talk about are, are going to be useful to think, to think about when you're uh, considering leaving. Uh, then you want to really uh, engage a lawyer to think about the type of entity that best fits your needs. Um, what I mean by entity is there's a plenty of different business forms. There's, um, there's uh, proprietorships, there's partnerships, um, there's LLCs, uh, there's corporations, and within corporations there's S corporations and C corporations. So we'll kind of try to talk a little bit about those things, but the key takeaway there is that all of those different forms have different pros and cons, um, and and you know it might not be a one size fits all type of thing. Um, so your your new business might have different needs that um, suggest maybe you should get uh, a certain form or other. Uh, third, we're going to talk about protecting your assets, and in those we don't just mean financial assets. A uh, company is more than just money. Uh, it's also you know your your intellectual property in. Oftentimes, your intellectual property is the most valuable thing you have as a startup, as a startup company. Um, we're also going to talk about protecting um, your human capital, your personnel. Um, you know what you need to do to comply with employment law, and, and um, what you need to do to make sure that um, you know you, your your employees don't uh, leave and steal your idea when they go. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about entering into contracts with with clients, with service providers, with investors. All of those things that, that you will absolutely need to think about um, if and when you start your own business. Um, like Joe said, a lot of you right now are not currently dealing with these issues with an employer with uh, non-competes and non-solicitation agreements. Um, it's something that is very standard with uh, different employers in the future. Or if you, right now you may want to look at whatever contracts, places you're um, working, working part-time. This nothing comes from nothing. You were working somewhere, you were doing something when you came up with the idea. So you have to think, does it fully belong to me? Do I owe anything to anyone? So maybe you guys could talk a little bit, uh, if there's anything that you wanted to add on. Who owns what? IP rights. Does anything that I have taken come from someone else? What do I have to give them in exchange? The, sorry, just you more, understood. There's, there's a few acronyms up there, uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page. IP means intellectual property. Um, that's you know who owns your idea. Uh, NCA means non-competition agreement. Um, that's like uh, if and when you leave your your position, your employer may have had you sign an agreement not to go into um, like uh, a business that would compete with the business that you're leaving. Not I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Can I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Non-compete agreements are uh, heavily creatures of state law. So um, when you look at one of these, you need to figure out whether or not it really is enforceable. For example, in California, an ordinary employee, uh, is the, the non-compete they sign is presumptively not enforceable. Um, different states have different rules for interpreting, interpreting them. Some will blow them up entirely, and there's a enforceability problem. Other states, like North Carolina, will kind of cross out the parts that are unenforceable and look at the agreement and try to read it. 
So uh, th their main value is deterrence. If you have one, most people feel kind of stuck and don't really go talk to somebody like us to figure out uh, whether it really is enforceable or not. Right, and even somewhere where they are enforceable or where they are unenforceable, you'll see employers who throw you know throw non-compete agreements at you that say you know I agree not to compete with with my employer in the field that they operate in anywhere in the world or anywhere in the United <laughs> States. Really, just it, things that seem crazily broad, but if you're looking at it and you don't know that it's unenforceable, it, it'll put you off pretty quickly. And employers, whether or not they know that they're unenforceable, will go ahead and put it out there for that deterrence value. So you'll, you'll run into it for sure. That brings us to the enforceability issue. And you know, even if, um, even if let's say that the agreement isn't enforceable, we have this other question is like, who wants to go as a startup to trial? You know, do you want to fight it in court? Who has the money or resources in order to do that? And so we kind of would discuss specifically for startups who have uh, less funding to try to fight for something, alternatives to litigation. Is that something that anybody wants to throw out some discussion, experiences? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're the if you're the startup who's being uh, told that you have to stop competing with me, I feel like most of the time we run into people who, if they don't want to go to litigation over it, will will often just take the you know put it under the you know put it in a drawer and ignore it approach to it. That's not a recommendable approach, really, but that's the one that I think is most commonly taken if you don't have uh, if you don't have counsel, and then. And then I guess you're putting it on the, I'm putting it on your employer to go to the expense to take it to court themselves. So, um. I would share one quick anecdote about an actual client that we've worked with who um, had a small business and did and worked in the arts actually, and she she taught something artistic. Okay, but she worked for a company that taught. They had many employees who taught these art this artistic thing, and I'm not going to say too many specifics about it. She wanted to leave and go and start her own business. But she had, as I would have, as many others, signed this employment agreement at the beginning, right? And in it was a very strict non-competition agreement governed by North Carolina law where it would, you know, there was some chance that it would be enforced. But even if it wasn't enforceable, she did not have the ability to fight this in court. The people who owned the business had more money than she did. She could not waste the little bit of money she'd saved to start her business on a, on a battle. Now, she freaked out because she didn't have she thought she didn't have the most recent contract that she'd signed. So after she turned in her resignation, she decided, I'll go into the office at my employer, open up my personnel file, and pull out a copy of, then that person, so she was all waiting, she, she didn't want to pay for a lawyer, right? So she did all this stuff before consulting a lawyer, and a lawyer would have helped her to navigate this. But once she did that, then the employer said, and I have you for trespassing. Right, because now you've broken into the broken into the office to get something that that she had signed, and it didn't help matters at all. In the end, what happened is they negotiated an agreement where she actually paid a, an amount of money for every one of her current clients that she took to her new place. It was an alternative to litigation, like Megan's mentioning, but it had to be negotiated, and she didn't know how to do it without the help of a contract lawyer, essentially, who could who could work this out. So her business, I think, it's true to say could not have gotten started had it not been for the assistance of a student attorney helping her to navigate that, that process. And that's one of the, and it could have been easier had she come to us earlier rather than a little bit later. So that's one of those places where you want to be aware. Yeah, I think just two other things on that. I mean, you know, one of the things that we've mentioned is the costs involved that, you know, that, that most people running startups don't have to spend on litigation, but it's also time too. If you're running a startup, that usually takes up you know, all of the available time you have. You don't. It's not just that you don't have money to pursue litigation, you just don't have time to do it. You don't have energy to do it. It's better directed elsewhere. Um, and two, and even if you're going with an alternative to litigation, if you're negotiating something, you can't do that without knowing what the position of your employer is. You can't, can't do that without no, knowing how strong their chances are of winning in court, how enforceable the agreement is. So even if you're not going to take it you know, up in front of a judge, having someone tell you what your position is is useful. So maybe um, that kind of uh, brought me to something that wasn't necessarily in your presentation, but we're thinking um, when you are at your employer, how, when you're at your job, how do you protect your product and how do you protect it from the employer saying, hey, we actually had something to do with this? 
so I think the question you raise is uh, if you're developing some kind of intellectual property, uh, you need to look at what you're doing and what the scope of your duties for your employer are. So it may w very well be that uh, there's cons consider considerable overlap uh, under the work made for, for hire doctrine. Your, your employer is really going to own that. So you, you want to know what you have assigned to the company. When we set up a new company and kind of our package, you know, we, we try to be pretty broad so that you, so the founder, won't have, you know, your 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 co-creators, you know, take it and, and leave and go somewhere else. And so we, we have um, basically our, our form says, um, you know, Exhibit A is a list of things that I've created. Anything else I create that might conceivably be within the scope of my employment, I'm assigning over to the company so the company owns it. And that provides very good trail later on when you're wildly successful in the next uh, startup company going public or your exit event or wh whatever that milestone is, they can look back and, and have the confidence that, that the assets are owned by the company. So um, I'd say look look to see what you signed first of all. Okay. So when you have your startup, you also want to make sure that your employees aren't, and we'll get to that, um, creating competitors to you. That's a um, I, I want to bring bring this home for a few people. You know, we, you might be thinking, "Oh, well, I'm not an employee yet." But how many people? I heard some graduate students. Does anybody get a paycheck at all from the university that might be considered? Okay, a couple people in the room. If you're an employee, one overlay on this is that when you work for part of it for a university, there are some complications also about who owns the IP, especially if you're an employee. There are things you do also need to navigate as a student sometimes. And there are policies that are available on Duke's website, but it's much more favorable to students. But if you have a role with faculty or you're even partnering, I heard some PhD, BME PhDs back there who may be working in some labs and doing some things, that, that can complicate ownership too. That's one of those things you want to do at the beginning. Before you take a risk and go try to start this company, as Megan's saying, you want to make sure you are clear about who owns the IP. And imagine telling your significant other, I'm just, I'll pretend mine, my significant other's name is Taryn. Taryn, um, I'm leaving and I'm not going to bring home a paycheck for 18 months. But it's a really promising idea and it's going to pay off in the long run. And she'll look at our two young children and say, that seems like a big risk because we have to feed those kids. <laughs> and I'll say, but trust me, it's going to be great. It's gonna, everybody's going to want this product. I get 18 months down the road, everybody wants my product, and that's where somebody else comes and says, you know what, you don't own that intellectual property, somebody else does. At that point, things are a mess, right? So this is one of those places where clarifying IP rights, it makes sense to spend a little bit of money, even if you have to, to work with a lawyer to make sure that everything's tied up nicely, rather than taking a huge personal and professional risk in getting down the road and, and getting embroiled in um, litigation. Think the Facebook story, right? I mean, think of how many people came out of the woodwork when that went, went gangbusters and said, I had a role in that too. And I bet you, you can analogize to things that you're working on as well. And even if you find out at the beginning that you actually don't own that piece of intellectual right. property, if you come up with an idea you know, at your place of employment, at your job, that's within the scope of what you were doing and it belongs to your employer because of uh, either because of what you agreed to when you signed up your employment agreements or just because of uh, operation of the law, it's much better to know that at the outset than before you go down that 18 month road. Okay, so Joe mentioned before what you have to consider when setting up a new entity. Um, when you're choosing different types, it also, I mean, they're governed by norms and by laws, but there are options that are going to have different tax liability implications, scalability, Investor preference is a big one. There are investors who won't consider certain types um, and controlling state law. And I'd love to throw that out to see if there's anything you guys had uh, opinions for our group. Sure. Um, I, I've actually, I, I've always heard the investor preference as being on the list, but I, I, I don't think I've really kind of run into it um, in a way that's really adverse to the deal because a lot of times we form a new entity anyway. Um, I mean, here in North Carolina, the law has come a long way. It used to be that you were in a state that didn't have a, a very well-developed business corporation law and was less flexible, resulting in natural bias for, for Delaware, which is where probably over half or 75 percent of the companies are organized if, if they're corporations. Um, but North Carolina is actually pretty good now. 
and Delaware franchise free fees um, went up a year or two ago, and, and so it's now more expensive. If, if you organize somewhere else, then you're look you know, you're, you're you're hitting two sets of filing fees every year, and that's that's just a little annoying. Another thousand, two thousand bucks, something like that. Um, I think the the major strategic consideration that isn't really well discussed um, relates to the ju judicial interpretation of certain types of cases. Uh, there's a, an, an emerging trend in which Delaware really bends over backwards to examine the fairness of certain types of transactions in which um, a, a class of shareholders essentially gets wiped out because there's not enough money for everyone to get paid. And if, if you are investing in a company uh, as a preferred shareholder, I'd say Delaware is a great place to be because the Delaware courts under this doctrine are, are going to look out for your interests. Whereas North Carolina doesn't follow that, that same precedent, they have kind of a different way of analysis. And so if you're a founder looking to squeeze out your preferred shareholders, maybe you prefer to be in North Carolina. Anything to add to that, Matt? Yeah, I, I operate in the startup world, so I actually see the investor preference a lot. Uh, most investors won't invest in LLCs for one reason or another. Um, but that's slowly changing a little bit, um, not so much here in, in North Carolina. Uh, but what, what Jeff is getting on is, is a big consideration, uh, especially since that's kind of come down the pipeline the last couple of years. So those sorts of preferences, you know, if you see really sophisticated investors like venture capitalists, they might prefer Delaware, especially if you're more on the West Coast. Whereas if you're, you know, you're more of a, a you know, early stage startup and you're incorporated here in North Carolina, they're probably gonna prefer it to be North Carolina, the franchise, tax fees, I, I deal with that, uh, you know, end of the year pretty much every year, and it's it's one of those situations where Delaware sends you this massive bill, and then they don't tell you that there's an alternate way to calculate your franchise fees, and so you then, you they, you know, they come around and say, a lawyer saying, you know, why, why do I owe this much money? And we're like, well, actually, you don't. Here's the alternate calculation, but it's just, it's a pain, and then, you know, you, if you're actually doing business, say, in North Carolina, you have to have a foreign qualification to do that. So that's an extra fee that Jeff was talking about. So it's really a matter of preference. And then ultimately, sort of, at least my experience, is sort of, you know, investor preference. You know, I've, I've seen clients that have, you know, uh, incorporated in North Carolina and, and had a big round. And, and one, of the, one of the considerations for the investor said you have to reincorporate in Delaware. But it's, it's pretty easy to do these days. So I wouldn't let that be a deterrent in, in terms of what you're trying to do. I, I would go with what Jeff's saying is looking at what's most favorable for you as a founder of the company and then what's going to make the most economic sense in the short term. Yeah, and I, I was speaking about state choice, choice of state. Mm -hmm. Choice of entity is definitely um, you right. know, a, a big part of it as well. If you're, for a growing enterprise, it, an LLC is just lacks flexibility. It, it, it's getting better. The IRS recently for instance, they issued some regulations that um, it, that they previously hadn't provided guidance on with respect to essentially LLC options. There used to be a big area of uncertainty. But it, it's just still more cumbersome and expensive to, to work through that analysis. Yeah, and absolutely. so corp corporations are just easier from a transaction cost standpoint to, to work with. Right. Just to take it back half a step, do people know the difference between a uh, when we're talking about an LLC versus a corporation versus anything else. Okay. Um, but so <clears throat> the reason that you would choose either of these is so that you're not operating as an individual person. The, the benefit of forming a, a company to run your startup out of is one, because of well, the limited liability aspect that they both share, right? So if someone sues your company, then that liability is kind of tied up in the assets that you have in the company you form. They can't come and take your personal house or your stuff or uh, that type of thing. So forming a type of company is very important one way or the other. If you're borrowing money to run your business, you can borrow that through or with your company again instead of individually and kind of cut things off from getting up to you individually. Uh, a limited liability company is a type of business that still has that you know, that shield from you as an individual, but uh, is sort of treated at disregarded for tax purposes. So if the company is making money, that's treated as as you making money. It's it, you don't get taxed on it until the cash comes up to 
or until the, the earnings come up to you individually. If you have a corporation, then the corporation itself uh, is, is taxed on anything it makes. And then you might be taxed again when you try and take money out of it. Um, so it might yeah. be worth asking, how many people here are, um, have at least begun to explore the question of creating an entity? Is there anybody here who is kind of has gone online at least and said, how do I make a business form? How do I create, how do I file for that? Okay. And I'm assuming the others, the answer for the others would be that you are earlier stage than that. You have some ideas or think you may have some ideas that down the road you would form a business. Is that right? See some head nods. So um, what's happening here, this is, we're, we're simplifying a complex analysis. And I actually think this is one of those places that in, if you were to just roll the dice, half the time the choice that you made if you did something online would be okay. The other half of the time, I wish people just wouldn't have done it without counsel from a lawyer. And um, sometimes that counsel can be just got received by going to what, you know, Kevin is lining up, the kind of series, educational series. You'll go to one on choice of entity and you'll understand what makes sense for you and you'll at least have a path. Sometimes though, there's a level of complexity that um, uh, in that decision making where it really does pay dividends to work with somebody. And I started to get excited, I'm not gonna lie. This probably, people from Smith Anderson and other places might say, well, this is not good when people start using online, um, you know, legal Zoom and things like that. I started to b believe in these, like maybe these can help people. Uh, we've had several clients recently where all legal Zoom has done is totally screwed it up for them. Um, and there might be some good ones, I'm sure there's some, we don't hear from them maybe when there's some, some good ones. <laughs> But to the point that they got their darn name wrong. I saw what they communicated to LegalZoom, wrote in their name, it came out and they formed the entity under a totally different name. The person who signed their um, articles of incorporation disappeared and they, could, they, they started operating business. They never passed authority on to the business and everything when an investor came in was called into question about whether they ever had authority to do that and we had to backtrack years to go back and try to, um, to, to make sense of this. I'm, I, you don't need to hear the whole story. But all I'm saying is when we talk about choice of entity, it does make sense, I think, sometimes to call a lawyer, say, um, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Can you at least give me a limited amount of time to talk through this? Also, the community here on campus, American Underground in downtown Durham, other places, frequently offers open office hours, okay? Where you can come in, you can roll in with your business plan, Right? And you can talk to them for a minute. It might only be a half hour or 45 minutes, but even that's better than not talking to a lawyer about doing this choice of entity. Would you agree? Absolutely. And one other thing that I'll just mention, uh, just to kind of add to what everyone said, the one thing we haven't talked about so far of the kind of buzzwords on this page is scalability. And I think that's where like kind of forward thinking kind of comes in a little bit. Like thinking about where you, not just where your idea is or where your business is right now, but where you want it to go in the future. So, you know, these different forms that we've been talking about, um, you know, some of the pros and cons is just how flexible they are. You know, a partnership, first of all, partnerships in general, bad idea, don't do partnerships. But, uh, you know, those are, those are gonna be good for, you know, two, three people maybe. Um, versus like an LLC, which, um, which has uh, members and, and can be you know, a larger group of, of owners and operators versus a corporation, which you know, can have that many owners, but then can also have shareholders as well. Um, so you have to think about you know, just exactly where you want your business to go and you know, how, much, uh, how much value you wanna place on, on having options and having flexibility in the future. Okay, so we threw a lot at you there, uh, with, and, and, and you know, we're happy to talk more about it in, in uh, the future and after uh, this presentation. Um, but let's just assume that you get past the entity creation stage and, and you've set up everything perfectly and you're super happy with, with, uh, your, with your new business. You still have to think about things. You still have to you know, consider um, other issues, right? And, and one of those key other issues is working with others, right? Um, whether you're in a partnership, or whether you form an LLC, or whether you form a corporation, you're gonna be working with other people, um, whether that's your co-owners, or your clients, or whatever. Um, so actually, uh, I'll just uh, bring it back to an example that Jeff threw out uh, a couple minutes ago, uh, which is Facebook. How many of you guys have seen The Social Network? Yeah? It's an awesome movie, I love that movie. Uh, <laughs> 
think about the social network and, and like the reason that the social network exists as a movie, right? They went through like years of like really contentious litigation and and, uh, and all that to, to get to that point where, I mean, can you imagine like turning legal depositions into a movie uh, otherwise? Like, yeah, nobody would wanna watch that. <laughs> but so it's really contentious, right? Um, there's also all kinds of, actually, if you guys have, uh, there's a really fantastic documentary for anyone who's an aspiring entrepreneur called startup.com. Uh, it's on uh, YouTube actually for free. Check it out. I mean, it's just really good. Uh, and it, it gets you to kind of think about the different ways that you interact with your partners um, in, in your business. And you know, you think, okay, like, oh, me and my partner, we're best friends. We're super tight. You know, we're never going to fight. He's never going to sue me. It's never going to be a problem. But you would be surprised. Um, and, and one of the reasons why you want to talk to a lawyer right at the beginning is to make sure that you have agreements and, and uh, you know, agreements on how to operate, agreements on how to share profits, all those things written down before you get into the nitty gritty of running your business. Because as soon as that happens, there's like a million different things that come up that you never thought about um, beforehand. And that's where you get into situations that can eventually devolve into litigation and kind of social network like drama. Um, yeah, so you're gonna turn from, from these guys into these guys, and, and you don't want that to happen. Um, it's another way to think about it, Jeff uh, told me about this the other day, think about it like kind of signing like a prenup uh, mm -hmm. before you get into a marriage. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say, I, I echo your point. I mean, when you bring somebody else into the sharing of profits, when it's a collaboration, that's when the rubber really meets the road. I mean, you, you can use the flawed legal Zoom documents if it's just you and, you know, the state might have your name wrong. And, you know, from a corporate being organized, it's not likely to matter that much right away. It's when somebody else is involved. And then you have to figure out how to, to sort things out. And, and the hardest hardest thing to do is to figure that out in a 50-50 relationship. It's a lot easier if, if you're up here and you have other people and it's clear who's, who's got the upper hand. But 50-50, it is like a, a marriage when you're thinking of the end of the enterprise. All right, how are we going to divide all this? Um, so the next two slides we're going to talk about uh, are slides that are kind of once you've gotten, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, you mentioned um, something about partnerships and I was a little intrigued by what you said about limiting partnerships to groups of two to three people. Why is that? Oh, I didn't mean to imply that, that um, they would be limited. Uh, it, it's just that partnerships in general. So one thing we talked about a little bit was, was the liability issue, yeah. right? And the big knock against partnerships is the liability issue, where if you're in, if you're in a partnership with somebody, um, you're liable not only for what you do, but also for what your partners do. Um, so if your partners make a mistake that screws over the company, you yourself, even though you didn't do anything wrong, could be liable for that. And and especially if it's uh, you know a situation where um, you know your personal property would be would be at stake. That's that's not a, a situation you want to get yourself into. Yeah, I think the only true kind of partnership is when you say, hey, let's go have a car wash this weekend, and and you, <laughs> and you go do it. Uh, I mean, almost every partnership you hear about is really a, a limited partnership, which is written down on paper. But a true partnership. It doesn't require anything in writing, and and that's where this unlimited liability concept comes into play. And, and some of the benefits of partnership, what what people used to, we are a partnership. It's not an entity. It's not unless it's something that you a limited liability, limited partnership, or something like that. If it's just people throw that term around because it's common parlance, partnership. But we used to use them and years ago before the LLC, especially, um, was developed, to allow for a certain kind of taxation, right? But you can achieve partnership taxation now with se in, in several ways with an entity. So there's what has happened over time is that the need for a partnership, as we used to talk about that, has been mitigated to some degree. And we can now achieve this wonderful thing of limited liability on one hand, which is great, as Peter described, and partnership taxation on the other hand, if that's what you're looking through, for, through an LLC or an S-Corp um, structure. So that, um, exactly like Joe said, joint and several liability is a scary thing in some situations, um, especially 
you know, if, if you can't fully trust your partners. To right. And, and what Jeff's talking about there when he's talking about partnership taxation is not being taxed at the entity level and then being taxed again at the individual level. It's just having the income flow up taxation. to the individual. Single taxation. Most startups, it turns out, don't have to worry about double taxation <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any profit. Really. <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess the first thing um, we're talking about uh, we're talking about the process of actually like running the company once you've already set it up. Uh, some of the things you, that you want to think about. And like I said at the very beginning, uh, break it down into into three different classes. Right? You've got your you've got your intellectual property and your physical property. You've got your financial assets, and then you've got your your um, you know personnel, your employees, uh, your your human capital. Um, and you know without without those things like your business uh, may not be long for the world. Um, so you really want to make sure that, those, that, they're, that they're protected. Um, we'll start at the top, and probably for, for most of the people in the room, uh, this, I mean, given, given kind of like the early stage, or maybe even like you're just even kind of thinking about, maybe thinking about an idea, um, your intellectual property is the thing that is going to be, I think, most valuable to you. When you're starting out, like Jeff said, Gave a great example of, you know, if, you, if you're going to put a lot on the line personally and professionally to set up a new organization based on an idea, you want to make sure that that idea is protected. Um, so, you know, you really want to make sure that, that you are the one that owns it, that nobody else is going to come in and say, oh no, we have a claim on that, or you developed it while you were working for us, so we actually own it, or whatever it happens to be. You want to make sure that it's really well protected. Um, one really basic way that you can do that already um, is by what's called a, a non-disclosure agreement. Um, so one of the one of the main problems with with uh, protection of IP is that people have this great idea and they can't wait wait to share it with their friends and their family or whatever. But as soon as an idea is out there in the world, if you haven't patented it or copyrighted it or whatever, it's potentially a fair game. So you really want to think about making sure that, that you keep that idea you know, tied up. And if you need to tell somebody about it, that they're not going to be able to go and blab. Right? So um, non-disclosure agreements, key. Uh, even when you don't even have a business to speak of, even when it's just an idea. And that's definitely something that you, know, you would want to talk to a lawyer about. Um, and then, of course, you know, as you get further down the road, um, and you start to really develop that idea, and you start to think about you know, building a business around it, uh, you know, legal advice becomes even more important. I just want to chime. We do have an IP presentation. Is that right, yes. Kevin? With that's coming up about different kinds, and the need to protect is particularly important with patents and trade secrets for slightly different reasons. But those two kinds of IP are particularly important um, for you to protect. And if you're sitting there, and if I heard a lot of BMEs, a lot of others, and you have something that's potentially patentable or whatever, and you and you're interested in continuing to explore, please do watch for that um, presentation that Kevin advertises to see um, if you can come to that. And I'm sorry. I didn't. And so if you see a lawyer before you've patented anything or anything about yeah, intellectual property, um, you don't have to do any non-disclosure forms, right? Is that true? Good question. As far as with the lawyers? Yeah. No, no, no. no. Yeah, that, that would be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the rules of professional responsibility for lawyers are probably much more robust than anything you could draft in the agreement, right? Yeah, I frequently get asked that by people. Can you sign this? And I, I, that's my exact response. Trust me, buddy. You have no idea how much we're real. Like, this is way more, you, you'd rather have the rules of professional responsibility apply. You, yes, you absolutely can talk to a lawyer. But, you know, many of you, particularly those who are in graduate school and might be to the point of publishing, you know, publication about an idea which might be so important for your career, right? You, and, you, and you're encouraged to, uh, to publish, and that's actually essential for the next stage of your career. That publication is the making public that we're talking about that might actually uh, disallow you from getting a patent down, down the road. So um, you may be, you may find yourself in an academic environment where you are about to put something out in the world and it makes sense to stop and uh, speak to a patent lawyer uh, about that. Or where you're starting to bring people together and you think, oh, we're all friends, it's fine, but you haven't taken steps to protect that and your t trade secret 
um, you, you won't be considered to have taken reasonable steps to, to keep a secret. So talking to a patent attorney or using NDAs are uh, both very important steps, even with your co-founders. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing, uh, the next thing, uh, will be you know financial assets. Um, this is you know clearly like once you've got the company up and running, um, you know maybe you have some income, maybe you have some investment capital. Uh, you want to make sure that that you know your everything that you're doing with your money and, and the way that you're getting your money is is um, uh, legal and, and on the up and up. So um, there's plenty of different. Uh, there's plenty of different types of law and, and things that, that interact there for the financial assets. Securities law would be um, definitely one of them if you're, you know, uh, if you're planning on issuing stock or if you're um, planning on issuing shares uh, of your company. What, or, say, what if you don't even know you're issuing stock? Like how, how do you protect yourself? You might accidentally be getting into securities law. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you're taking, if you're taking money from from anyone really in exchange for a piece of the company, even if you're not giving them a, a piece of paper that's you know, a stock certificate, you're probably issuing them a security. If you're accepting money from investors for any reason in your company, it's worth at least taking a, a hard look at whether or not it's a, a security. People fall into that trap almost constantly. I'm sure, Matt, you see that almost daily. Yeah, all the time. And, and you, you run across it more so, you know, we're talking, going back to entity choice LLC versus uh, you know corporations and LLC can't have member m membership interests which are can be considered uh, uh, securities as well so even if you're just you know had a have a lifestyle business and you know you're uh, you know running as an LLC and then you bring someone in you know you should still consult an attorney because you're likely issuing a security in that situation right yeah and it seems like people really run into trouble when they're looking at taking money not from you know, outside investors but from their friends or, or family yeah there and is. If, if you take a thousand dollars from your mother and she takes you know, and she gets a percent in your company you've just sold her securities and even even crowdsourcing there's this mm -hmm. I call it a myth that you can now go online and have hundreds of people invest a hundred dollars and and the securities laws won't magically apply anymore. We're not we're not quite there yet. And and, and, and so at all, if, uh, if you look at a lot of these platforms, you you get down to it, you find out oh I'm actually donating <laughs> to these worthy projects and not getting a uh, share of the upside. Yeah, so that's a good distinction. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those that you might be mm -hmm. now, you can technically in various ways get in trouble there if the if what you're receiving in return looks like. Uh, equity interest, and we could give some crazy examples there, but for the most part, 99.9% probably, what you're doing truly, as Jeff said, is donating money, and they might give you some swag in return, right? Like here's some beer, uh, Ha River Brewing, which was one that um, was enticing to me. They gave some beer mugs, right, with the Ha River, very nicely stenciled on it, but that's all you're getting. You're not getting a stake in the company. If you're doing anything, just to emphasize, in return for part ownership in the company, that is probably going to qualify as an investment contract under securities laws. And um, so just to reiterate where we are so far, forming an entity, probably should talk to an attorney. Have some valuable IP, probably should talk to an, an attorney. And definitely before you exchange equity for money, talk to an attorney, because this is probably of all the areas the most complex for you to navigate on your own. In fact, I've never seen anybody, a non-lawyer, do it successfully, I will say. And so um, this is this is one to, to talk about. Yeah, yeah, especially if, if you're planning on going somewhere where eventually you want to bring in outside investors from who are going to put in you know, more significant money. That's the thing that we see them most concerned about is what you've sold to other people in the past and, and how you've done that. Is there a question in the back? I don't about working services. That's a co-worker and you want to review your business plan. I mean, stuff like that. Do they feel like they own something because they help you with your development? How does that work? So if, if, services without, without paying mm -hmm. money, just the service and the help. So if, if you're giving them a, an interest in the company in exchange for the services, or, or if, or if just you're just dealing with them feeling invested in it. How do you prevent that? Oof, uh, <clears throat> that? That's a communication thing, I think. Uh, it, it's not not so much a, a legal issue. I mean, you can make it a legal issue, and it doesn't hurt to get that on paper, but I think that's just a, a communication point when you're dealing with them uh, up front, being very clear that it, this is just a, a cash-for-services arrangement, and you, know, you 
appreciate their help very much, but it's your company still. No, a related concept is you can be a service provider in a company and get options, so get equity, mm -hmm. essentially in exchange for, for services, and there's a securities exception that probably structured will cover that transaction. <coughs> Right. If, if you very, want very to easily, give them. If, if you're the company. Yeah. That's something that's hard to set up. If you're a non-lawyer, to set that up um, it's not actually that easy. But it, it applies easily, but it's um, it's not something that you can just do on your own. But the key, you said, was if properly structured. If properly structured, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To what extent can you request for feedback on your idea to like pilot studies, uh, given that there's like public disclosure and experimental disclosure? I, I, I'd love to hear others. We deal with this a lot, actually, and so um, uh, people obviously need to get feedback and their, their idea evolves over time. There's a couple of issues that come into play. Um, so pilot studies, we have very frequently worked with folks who use a, a kind of non-disclosure agreement, and so people come in and you, you can do it in nice ways. You can give information about here's what you're involved in, here's what the ex mutual expectations are. One of those things that they can say is that everything that happens there is confidential. Another thing is that a little bit more than just being confidential is they might give you some feedback that helps you to develop for your product and that actually could you could see how that could become a claim for intellectual property right I contributed that and so more than just confidentiality you might also want to consider kind of assignment of IP types of issues in, in those environments and there may be other things to consider too um, though that's one of those things that if you're running a whole bunch of tests and you think your IP is really valuable, that would again be, I think, one of those triggers where it's worth doing kind of a limited scope engagement with an attorney who's proper in the area or finding a form. Sometimes attorneys will work with you and allow you to do some of it yourself and, get, and give it a review. There may be ways to keep costs down, but that's a really valuable um, uh, situation where it makes sense to, to be careful. I'm glad you brought that up because that happens a lot at universities. So. Okay. Um, so we've also, we're, I'll just kind of skip over the partnership risk since we already talked about this a little bit. Um, and then just to highlight again, any choice and personal liability and, and taxes. We don't have to go over that again. We've been over that a lot and we're happy to answer more questions about it. But I think the point is that, you know, a lot of these things and especially the securities laws aren't necessarily things that you would think about. Um, and, and that's exactly why you might want to engage a lawyer, because the lawyer is going to think about them for you. Um, so the third, the third category would be uh, like your, your human capital, your human assets. And, and think, about, um, think about what happens, what goes into you know, hiring employees for your company. Uh, it's not just saying, like, you come work for me and I'm going to pay you X. You, know, you, have to, you have to comply with all kinds of employment laws. You have to um, you know, potentially uh, think about um, like doing uh, like 401ks and, and insurance and uh, all kinds of things that, that uh, are tied to working for somebody. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, what happens when employees leave? Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about, um, uh, you know, non-competition agreements and non-solicitation agreements and how they might hurt you when you leave an employer. But potentially if you have an employee that leaves, like those things could hurt you as the employer. Um, so you need to be thinking about, you know, how you would start to craft those those uh, documents and, and making sure that there's no uh, competition with your former employees and, and that, um, actually I'm not sure that we covered this earlier, but a non-solicitation agreement um, is, is uh, an agreement where if an employee leaves an employer, um, they agree not to poach a bunch of their former colleagues um, from the employer to take with them. Um, so you know, think about how think about how problematic that could be from the perspective of an employer. Um, you know, maybe maybe the entire value of your company is in the expertise, the specific expertise of your employees. Maybe you have a phenomenal team of programmers, um, and if they all leave, well, all of a sudden you know you have no more value left, right? So that's definitely something you would think about as as the owner of a of a company or the operator of a company. I would add one thing too, and I want to ask Matt about this. So let's imagine a hypothetical. We have, I'm going to go back to biomedical engineering. So let's imagine that you have this great device that's going to revolutionize a certain kind of surgery because currently they have to cut you open and then plan the surgery. And you spend hours in the operating room, right, getting um, uh, all these tests done on you and it hurts and you're on, me you're on meds and it costs hospitals a lot of money because the OR is involved. But you have a non-invasive, an invention 
for a non-invasive surgical prep tool, okay? And it's gonna change things tremendously. And you have somebody who is the, the genius behind the, the engineering, you have a programmer who's doing certain computer aspects of it, and, and then you need some money, okay? And you, at the beginning, you form a company and you give each of the key components part of the company. And you say, here's, let's say, a third to you, a third to you, and a third to you. And they have it outright. They just have a third of the company. Now, Matt, I'm an investor who knows that this company needs a lot of development, probably five to 10 years of development before it really is profitable. But I'm willing to invest in it and move it along. Am I gonna be happy that those key founders, key components of the business, already have all of their equity in the company outright? Absolutely not. Why? Well, because then they, you know, if, if one of those key components leaves, what are, you, what are you left with, you know? They have, you know, they're, they're one third of the company, it's already to them, they can, you know, leave go do something else and still own one third of the company and you know they really hold the power at that point whereas what jeff is alluding to is you know you you want to enter into you know stock repurchase agreements that basically says that you know here's a vesting schedule uh generally standard is you know one year <coughs> cliff means that if you leave the company or you're terminated from a company that if within the first year of that agreement uh you none of the none of your stock invests and therefore you don't actually own any of it. And then after the first year, 25% of it would vest and then you'd have monthly vesting thereafter. So after four years, you would fully own your one third of the company. Right. And that way, you know, you, you really protect the company that way from, you know, having this, you know, a situation where you have a, a person who owns one third of the company and they're really not contributing anything any longer. And in that case, other investors absolutely, you know, probably won't invest in the company or, make you go out and buy and purchase them and, and uh, you know buy out their one third and at that point you know your departed co-founder holds all the cards and they're going to say okay well i'm buying the company at you know so the 10 million dollars yeah so when megan and joe mentioned human assets we, we talk about employees and other service providers but founders i mean founders are absolutely key and they're the ones when investors look at a company they want, you know, they often not times are paying most attention to the founders, right? And so this is a means, what's described as vesting, is a means of ensuring that founders have an incentive to stick around. And if you set it up wrong, imagine setting up that company and just filling it out and saying, here's your stuff. You know, there, somebody can be gone by the time you catch that mistake and have already given away a third of the company. And that's a really big deal. So it's, it's an example of the kind of mistake that sloppy founding or slop, sloppy setting up of the company I can do, and it's essentially related to keeping your human assets around. So, the, I'm sorry. The one last thing, and, and we'll move on, the one last thing I'll mention is, is just kind of, again, like before, thinking about where you want to go with your company. Um, thinking about an exit strategy, uh, you know, whether or not it's, we're going to have this company, we're going to have fun for a few years, we're going to see if we can make a buck, and then we're going to, leave it behind, we're gonna fold it up and we're gonna take the profits. Or maybe it's, we're gonna build this thing into a point where we have um, you know, this great uh, investor come in and, and buy us out and, and we're gonna make a lot of money and sail off into the sunset. Or maybe it's we want the investor to buy us out but then we wanna still be part of the company once it's been folded in. Um, there's a whole bunch of different avenues, it's all personal preference, but you definitely want to consult with somebody um, while, you're, while you're thinking about it just to kind of game plan that. Right, so um, you're going to have to enter into contracts, and there are many where you may want a lawyer to be involved. Um, investors, as our panel was saying, don't take the money until you know what's happening there. Uh, do they share your vision? Are there conflicts of interest? Do you know what you're giving up? Don't just take the cash. Um, so there are times when you're going to want to have your lawyer also looking over what it is that you're giving up in exchange. So anything that you wanted to add to yeah, that's a big topic. So um, if you have a, a product or an invention or a service that, that's really going to, I mean, it's really sound and um, you have a good management team. I mean, it's actually hard the first time around because venture capitalists, angel investors, they, they're investing in you, in the management team. Um, you know, the best product in the world is not going anywhere with the wrong team in place. And um, But the ones that are really good are going to, um, you're going to find a lot of people are interested in that. There's a lot of money chasing a few good ideas. And so if you really have something good, you, you, you're probably thinking, what's the value add? Not just the financial terms, but what's this financing source 
bringing to the table? How are they going to be partners for the long run? What kind of, how active are they going to, going to be in, in, in managing this company? What kind of relationships do they bring um, that will assist you in opening doors and, and growing your business? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On the sharing of your vision point, I, mean, I think that goes back to what Joe was saying a minute ago about what about your exit strategy, what, what you want to get out of it. If you're looking to grow the company up and sell it off and, and take your money out and move on, then you know, you're going to find a lot of investors who are really willing to do that with you and are on board with that idea. It's harder to get people on board if what you want is to grow your company for a long time and have it be the thing that you do and the thing that you're interested in just keeping floating on as long as you can because you like doing it. Investors, and it is a complicated topic, but the, I, the idea with most investors is that they run funds that have short lifespans. They have investors who are putting money and expecting pretty high returns, and they spread it around to a lot of product or to a lot of projects. So they need things to do really well and to do really well quickly. If what you're not look, or if what you're looking for is to you know, to make your company grow as quickly as you can and then sell it off. That's easy, but it's good to know up front if that's what your investors want, if it's not what you want. Um, other contracts that you may want to engage a lawyer um, are those with buyers and sellers. If you're not able to ensure payment or performance and know the terms, um, and it could they actually come in in any way and compete with you? If, if someone is providing you with some kind of service or um, Piece, could they end up making the end product something they could do better, cheaper, and they already have the capacity, and then they'll just... I tell you, in almost every contract you'll see will have an indemnification clause. And when you get to your eyes, you're going to kind of glaze over, like, what is all this? <laughs> it's boilerplate. You'll just kind of move on. Um, but that section is, could be the most important section in the entire contract, because what it's saying is, if something bad happens, you're agreeing to you know, possibly an unlimited budget to stand in and hire law lawyers to solve this other person's problem. And um, that can bankrupt, you know, the company. Um, so it is actually negotiated, and when two lawyers are involved, if the bargaining power is equal, they'll come to a, a reasonable compromise. Now, if, if you're an ant and you're dealing with an elephant, you just might have to <laughs> kind of suck it up. But it, it's good to at least know and test that because, um, you know, that boilerplate matters. Yeah, and on, on those lines, there's other things that just lawyers think of through experience that sometimes in your situation, you're the expert at what you do, but lawyers are trained to take a step back in an outside perspective. And if you don't mind, Meg, I'm going to tell one quick story. We had a great, very go-getter team of graduate students from Duke, from one of the schools, who came up with a product that was, if I could tell you about it, it's it's, you can understand how there's much interest in one large retail chain, okay, a very large retail chain with over 800 stores nationwide got very interested in one of their products and they were going to start using them um, in the way that they use it, they could use it on, the store could use it on a lot of their products. Well, we saw this contract that was handed by this large retail chain, right? They're going to hand you something and want you to sign it. And there are a lot of things like an indemnification clause that there was kind of a David versus Goliath, right? There's just a, a complete inequity there and things that they just didn't quite understand that they were promising. Now turn around. Their product depended on one place that they had that was going to do everything for them to then deliver it to these clients. And that one place was actually quite small. Not really clear that they could do it on the timeline and everything that this other company was expecting. And they had no written contract with that service provider, right? So not only did they have only one of those service providers, they had no contract with them, and that service provider was making no, on the other end, representations or warranties about what they could provide. That's the kind of thing where you say, well, look, we, we were happy to get this big retailer. We just signed with it. A lawyer can come in, and even if you can't negotiate with that big service provider, you at least on the other end with another important relationship can say, one, you need another service provider at least. You need multiple people who can do this for you. You need non-exclusivity clauses and all that. You need um, representations and warranties about their turnaround time in order to just satisfy this other contract, right? And so that kind of outside thinking is a real value add that lawyers will provide when you work with them. And if you're working with a lawyer, I will say, who doesn't give you that level of value add, you should find a new lawyer. Okay, because what Joe said at the beginning, doesn't understand the business is a common gripe. I think that's a bad lawyer. He was describing not lawyers, but bad lawyers, right? 
A good lawyer and the ones that we work with consistently and the ones who we know will want to know about your business. They'll want to know about your industry and they're going to ask you business questions, right? They're going to, it's going to be a huge value add in the contracts in the sense of legal terms and in business terms. And, and that's, um, that's bang for your buck, I think. Uh, um, Maria, let's go into Jeff. Yeah. Summer. So, guys, I, first of all, I appreciate you hanging with us for, for this long. Uh, we've got two more slides left. Um, we're just going to quickly summarize, and then um, we're going to get to the final slide, which is, uh, you know, given all that we've talked about, about why you should, you know, really think about getting a lawyer, uh, we're going to talk about how you actually got find a lawyer. Um, so first of all, just to summarize, uh, again, the things we talked about today, why do you want legal advice? You want legal advice when you're leaving your job, when you're setting up a new company, when you're dealing with anything involving intellectual property, or money, or employees, <laughs> or when you're working with contracts, and basically that means you always want legal <laughs> advice. Uh, you know, as we've been talking about, a lot of the things that you want to be advised on aren't things that you would necessarily even think about. You know, everyone in this room is very smart, very capable, um, but but a lot of times the law is uh, you know opaque and and kind of up here in the ether and it's really hard to get at it, right? Uh, and, and that's why you want to talk to someone who knows all of those things that you just may have no reason to, to ask or, or to think about. Um, all that said, we, you know, we also know that like, you, especially when you're just starting out, may not have the money or the, or the time or the, the energy to, to go out and, and you know, find a lawyer. And, and maybe it's just not practical for you at, at a given time. So what we're saying is maybe go out and, and if you're at a position where it's practical to seek counsel, you know, maybe, maybe consider doing it. And what does practical mean? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on, on each individual person, each individual company, each individual idea. So, you know, think about getting counsel, you know, with, given, given your financial resources, given uh, the availability of uh, legal resources, and given just how quickly you want to get your, your idea off the ground. Um. And um, Reese's always means, you know, it will be necessary at so many points. But there are a lot of things that you can do yourself. And um, right here on the list, we have self-help. There's a lot of things that you can do. And you can work with lawyers who will help you help yourself. And that's something we do with, with clients occasionally who say, I know mostly what I'm doing. There are just a few things here. And can you offer a la carte services? Um, so. The first thing Jeff talked about was legal zoom, sometimes leading things wrong. So free advice is available online. Use it with caution. Um, SBA.gov actually is a great resource. I've, I've met a lot of um, entrepreneurs who have score mentors, um, someone who maybe has a similar um, similar type of business and you can ask for At advice. SBA, by the way, is the Small Business Association or Administration? Administration. administration. Yeah. Um, but here locally, we have NC Leap, which um, people I've met from there have been like extremely helpful uh, in helping with the NC Bar Association. Um, so we talked about local firms and their fee structuring, which Jeff threw out a number where that was uh, something where you can know it's not something that's impossible. And when you consider the losses, the potential for losses down the road, it actually is a pretty small investment. Can I give another example of fee structure? So um, I don't know if people who, because many people seem to be nodding their heads thinking about patents. Patents are expensive, time-consuming processes. We're talking three to five years and probably $15,000 to prosecute a patent at the very least. And that's before you do all your upkeep and all that on the patents in the long run. I mean, we're talking about a, a big early chunk of change. A lot of people who are testing ideas aren't willing to throw that down, right? And wisely aren't willing to throw that down. And, uh, something that, when you talk to a patent attorney though, they'll tell you, well, there's something called a provisional patent application, right? And it helps give you time to explore in a way where you won't lose your idea and actually um, can be very beneficial and much lower cost and then potentially save you a lot of costs or potentially losing a patent later. So along with asking firms about fee structuring, asking early and being clear about what your limitations are and what your needs are can also save you a lot of cash. So ask questions, ask for creativity, um, you know, ask if you can work along with them and, and minimize your costs, but also ask if you um, ask early and you're going to have a, um, potentially some, some lesser legal fees. Right, just calling to ask that question. It's not that the billing clock is going as soon as they say, like, 
Well, I'm gonna help you if you've Not never always, met them, yeah. so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and of course, that's what the Startup Ventures Clinic is here for, so here's Jeff Ward and here's our Twitter at Duke Law Startups. Yeah, we're, um, we do post resources pretty frequently, and so following that can be helpful if, if you're interested. The Startup Ventures Clinic, I wish we could serve more. Um, we do work on the very unreal world schedule of semesters, and so we tend to take people at the beginning of the semester and we take a certain kind of case. Um, that being said, I'm happy to try to help make recommendations for folks. Um, I, I, a couple people sitting at the table here know that when I think they're the right um, people for the job, I, I'll refer people to them. There are other resources around that I um, sometimes refer people to, and uh, I, you know I'm happy to have a discussion uh, if that's what, what, what makes sense for you. We also, I just would encourage you, I mean, somebody mentioned to me that this was really helpful and maybe we don't need to have an individual discussion that we were planning. We, we're here on campus giving resources. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, there's a, a whole bunch of them coming out and around the community. Getting on those listservs, like, or following on Twitter, will make uh, a, a lot of this available that may satisfy some of your early stage educational needs around the law, if not your direct client uh, needs. So. Yes. Uh, on choosing a lawyer, I'll, I'll say choosing a lawyer should not be like choosing a dentist. <laughs> you should like your lawyer. There's lots of choices, so if, if, if you're feeling like it's not, not going well, find, you know, find another one. Yeah, and I would add to that one thing that, um, this was counterintuitive to me at first about choosing a lawyer. So Smith Anderson is 120 attorneys in one of the premier law firms in North Carolina. It's the, lar I think maybe the largest North Carolina only law firm. And it's, it's a big full, what we call a full service firm. You can go there and get everything done, essentially, okay? I mean. There are solo practitioners around the area. I mean, I have my own private practice, but I don't do everything, right? I only do a little, uh, certain things. Um, there's people who do only trademark, and they're wonderful at trademark. They're actually geniuses at trademark, but they, they don't do everything, right? Some people tend to go to smaller shops because they will charge a lower fee, but there's two things that you should know about that. One is you're probably gonna have to end up hiring along the process multiple lawyers then. You're gonna have to have relationships with a lot because it's not a full service shop. The other thing is what I mentioned before. When I said $2,000 to $2,500 for that entry level entity creation and things like that, that's not because that's what it costs. That's what you call a lost leader. Sorry, if you plug your ears if you, you, if you don't want to. I know, I know, I used to work at a big firm like that. That's, they're not, they're, they're, their associates and everybody are working way more on that than what they're getting in return. It's a loss leader. They're excited to bring you through their door because they're excited about you and they want you to make money someday so that you can pay them some fees, right? And so it works both ways. Great, I have a relationship with a lawyer I like who pays attention to me and, I'm gonna, and is gonna grow with me and it's part of an organization that can keep providing services to my business. On the other hand, they say, we, we took a risk on you, we brought you through our door, and we're excited that you're growing with us and that you keep using us for services. So that's something to consider between maybe a slightly cheaper, smaller shop and what we might call a full service firm. And I typically tend to send people to full service firms. That's just the way I roll because I think it's, it's better for, for their growth. Sorry, what was the name of that firm again? You were mentioning the biggest, the biggest. Uh, Smith Anderson, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, but there are you know there are others in the area that provide um, similar things. We, so I, I, you know, I'm happy to give very direct um, feedback about my experience with lots of firms in the area. There's a reason why we work so closely with Smith Anderson. I'm not trying to become like a salesperson for Smith Anderson. I just um, they they they're, they're, they're always impressive, and we work with a lot of people in the area. I've never made a reference to Smith Anderson and had the person call back and ask for a second reference. They're always excited. So. Matt, by the way, is a Duke Law grad and also a graduate of our specialized degree in um, law and entrepreneurship, and um, which is something that we have near. And he's one of the only graduates I think that works in the area now in that in that area and really specializes in um, law and entrepreneurship. One other thing on that, I mean, we, we do practice in almost every area, but there are things we don't do and. One thing that we're always happy to do is tell you who else to go talk to. So we don't prosecute patents at, at Smith Anderson, but if you need to find somebody who prosecutes patents, we know a lot of people, and we're always happy to tell somebody who we think is really good at it, whether or not you end up, yeah. you know, ever working with us. Yeah, right. I should say like almost no firm is totally full service, but right. it's closer to that. It's a full relationship firm, and you can go. I mean. I can say this is public news, Quintiles, right, is a firm that, um, you know, went through its IPO and all that kind of stuff and is on the market because of the Smith-Andersons of the world and they can help the big companies too, so.
Yep. The other thing you should expect from your lawyer is counsel recommendations. Uh, some lawyers won't tell you, won't push you in the right direction, and 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 if you're paying money for their their time and experience, it, it'd be nice to get a recommendation too. I mean, you're going to have to make your own decision, and they can tell you the pros and cons. But um, some lawyers just don't want to have to deal with the consequences of, of things not working out well, so they won't actually give a recommendation. And I, I think clients are, are poorly served. We can do other yeah. general questions, or we could have um, a time when people can, you're welcome to come up and chat with us about questions. You, I, will, I want to say one thing about chatting with us. The question was asked about confidential. If, we, if you want, we could find a place around this confidential. There is a thing in North Carolina, the bar approves limited scope um, uh, legal services. I'm happy to actually talk to you a little bit if you want for a couple minutes about something that you might have going on. But also, I think since it is a short time, do watch for open office hours that may be offered on campus, and we'd be happy to us or whoever's involved in it is happy to have you sit down, be confidential about what's going on, and give a, a, a couple recommendations for you at that time. So, thank you all. So, yeah, otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. And, thank you yeah. for our I would much prefer to, to have a headquarters here so that if it came to your enforcement, even if there's a treaty violation, that you would be able to enforce it. Sure. I would not go over the button. Does that make sense? Where you can get the <laughs> Are you that's one that you'd want to talk to? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, the, you know, I'm not the right person to ask that question. Uh, not, actually, I think none of us are probably the right person to ask that question, but we have people that we would recommend. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a my code actually over there. Yeah. If you wanted to email me at the start of the page, um, it's online. I'm not sure. Um, I'd be happy to give you a list of some folks, who, particularly in that kind of web app, or sorry, mobile app area, um, who can help me answer yeah, uh, that question. Uh, that may, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we can give a little science and There are more people that I see. Yeah, so I'm Oh, really? That's awesome. <laughs> 
So you're, oh, so you're, so everyone's, so you're, 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 so you're